Ephesians chapter 1, we've been in a series on just the first 14 verses, chapters, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and we've called it every spiritual blessing, and we've been highlighting what the Apostle Paul says about some of those blessings that we have been given in Jesus Christ, and we've looked at the blessing of being chosen, the blessing of predest being predestined before the foundation of the world. We've looked at the spiritual blessing of being made holy and adopted into the family of God, the blessing of being redeemed. Last week, we looked at the blessing of being forgiven. And today, I want to use the word perhaps not in a text, per se in the text, but the idea is there it may be used in one of the translations you have. But I want to talk about the spirit, the uh, blessing of enlightenment, the blessing of enlightenment. So if you have your Bible this morning, just read with me. We'll not read all 14 verses this morning, but begin with me in verse 3, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Now let's go back and read verse 8 again, that God has lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. One of the spiritual blessings we received in redemption is enlightenment. Enlightenment. Let's see if we can understand that today. The late, great R.C. Sproul said, your quest for God does not begin until conversion. We hear people say, oh, I sought God, I seek for God. But I agree with Dr. Sproul because he's, nothing, he's doing nothing but quoting Romans 3 that says there's none good. No one is good. There are none that seek after God. The Bible says no one seeks after God. And so Sproul says, and I agree, and the Bible teaches that the only way that I seek after God is because something has already had to have happened to cause me to turn to God. Something's had to already happen. And Sproul says, and, and most academic good theologians agree, your quest for God doesn't begin until conversion. That's when you begin seeking God. And here the Apostle Paul has talked about some very strong and deep subjects. Chosenness, election, predestination, the foreknowledge of God, what God has done for us before the beginning of the world. And after his initial blessing in verse 3, and the verse 3 verses, he just launches in verse 3, Paul does, in, he, he, he just can't help himself. All this stuff just begins tumbling out from Paul, from Paul's pen about our spiritual blessings. He, it's as if he can't write fast enough in order to tell us what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. I want to give you three things real quickly about all of these blessings. Number one, God's blessings upon us are large scale. Look in verse 3, praise be the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. They're large scale. They're huge. They're comprehensive. They're exhaustive. God does not give you a little bit at salvation and then give you a little more when you reach another level and give you a little more when you reach another level and give you a little more. God doesn't work like that, although there's a lot of teaching these days that teach that. 
that you have to constantly be begging God for something more, that you've got to keep negotiating with God, begging for the next level and begging for the next step. The Bible's clear that when you have been converted in Jesus Christ, you have received everything God has intended for you everything. I'm fully redeemed, fully converted, fully adopted, fully forgiven. I am already everything in Jesus Christ that God planned for me to be. It's all by God. But then it's loving. Now, I pointed this out before. In verse 4, Paul reminds us everything God did in Jesus is in love, that little prepositional phrase, in love. Here he says specifically, he predestined us. Well, you know, Jack, I don't understand all that election stuff and chosen stuff and predestina- predestination and all that stuff. And in fact, it, you know, if it's preached certain ways, I just don't agree with it. and It garbles my mind. Well, here's, here's where your trust for God comes in. Can you believe God is a loving God? If he's done everything in love, whether it's chosen some before the foundation of the world, (laughs) it was the loving thing to do. The question is not what God has done. The question is how deeply do you believe his divine love? That's the question. Paul said everything God did, he did it in love. It's all God. It's all motivated by God. And then it is lavish. We read this. He mentions this word a couple of times in verse 7. In him we have redemption down toward uh, the latter part of the verse. In accordance with the riches of God's grace, verse 8, that he lavished upon us. That he lavished upon us. God's grace is overflowing. It's more than enough. It's more than you need. He only uses the overflow to save us. So it's comprehensive, large scale. It's loving. And it's lavish. Everything, every blessing we receive bears those three qualities in it from God. And Paul bookends these blessings. Verse 3, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the middle, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 12, to the praise of his glory. Verse 14, to the praise of his glory. Who gets the credit for what he has done? He does. He does. That's why he chose you before the foundation of the world so you wouldn't take any of the credit because you weren't around back then. That's why he wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life before you ever breathed your first breath because he wanted to make sure you understood you did nothing in this. It's all him. It's all grace. It's all Christ, and it is lavish. 1 John says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about this wisdom, this understanding, this enlightenment that Paul brings up here. You have to study this text, in verses 8 and 9 especially. He has lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So he has given me Wisdom and understanding. Now, don't go off on a pig trail with that. Wisdom to have my best life now. No, that's not what Paul's talking about. Wisdom to make a lot of money. He he can do that, but that's not what he's talking about here. This is a salvific text. This text is about salvation. When he talks about wisdom and understanding, it is in regard to the other things he's talking about. Redemption, adoption into the family of God, forgiveness. So so don't take the wisdom and understanding out of that context. He's still talking about salvation. And in our English text, as we read this, we would think 
the way it, it, it translates into English, or the way they have translated it, that it is God's wisdom that he is giving us. It is his understanding that is being exercised. But in the original language, in the Greek language, that's not it. He, he does give us that, but it's not necessarily his wisdom as he created the earth or goes about his sovereign task, it is the wisdom that he gives us to recognize Christ as Savior. Again, he's talking about salvation. He's talking about salvation. His wisdom is given to understand the mystery of his will. What is his will? To save those that he mentioned in verse 4. That's his will. That's the mystery of his will. So he gives wisdom and understanding to those whom he has called so they will recognize their pitiful state in sin and turn to Christ as Savior. That kind of wisdom. That kind of understanding. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, Paul said, The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. What Paul is saying, and I know it's tough words, but Paul is simply saying the natural person without the Holy Spirit Without conversion, without redemption, they hear the gospel and they don't understand it. They don't get it. They ask questions like, well, why should I be accountable to God? Well, who is God to demand anything of me? Why? They don't get the gospel because they don't have the spirit. They don't un God hasn't given them their, his spirit to help them understand the gospel. And I'm sure many of you, you shared your faith with people and you, you, you used every Bible verse, and, and you used every plan, evangelistic plan, and you used your best logic and reason. I've done that. And, and the person to whom you're share, with whom you're sharing Christ still didn't get it. They just didn't understand it. Why? Exactly what Paul was saying. The natural man, the unconverted person does not understand the gospel. Therefore, something has to take place to get a dead mind to be quickened to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, hang on with me. I'm going somewhere. Natural, natural man doesn't understand it. So he talks about wisdom here. Wonderful, beautiful Greek word. It's, it's the Greek word Sophia. A lot of ladies are named Sophia. The word means wisdom. And in it, there are many nuances, including the idea of sound judgment, yes. But the idea of wisdom throughout the New Testament and the Old is, is a, a certain knowledge that's been granted to a person so they can see things clearly. That's wisdom. And isn't that, isn't that what wisdom is? It's just the ability to see something clearly and make a sound judgment. The natural, unsaved, unregenerate, unredeemed, unforgiven person cannot understand the gospel. I know when I was almost 18 years old, I've shared my story. I went forward on a Thursday night revival service about two minutes till nine o'clock at a Baptist church, on the first verse of Just As I Am, you don't get saved any more Baptist than I got saved. And I knelt down, and as sincerely as I knew, I prayed for God to save me. But over the years, I've come to understand that I had no clue what I was doing that night. Because I, th I had been taught salvation was about straightening up and flying right. Salvation was about letting go of your bad stuff, turning over a new leaf. And that was, as a, as a kid, an 18-year-old kid, when I, I was about to graduate from high school, and my thought was, 
you know I need to start manning up because I know it's hard to believe. You see me now, all Christian and everything. But I was a hellion in my teenage years. There's always one who knew me back then. And I was about to graduate from school. And my idea about the gospel, well, I'd, never, I'd gone to Baptist churches all my life, and I'm not, I'm not picking on Baptists. This is a problem in every denomination. Because I never really heard the clear-cut gospel, that the gospel is not about me being better. It is about the blood of Jesus Christ who cleanses me from all sin and saves me by his grace. And so when I knelt that night, I was sincere, but I prayed a prayer based on all the years of teaching I had been taught, and that was this. Before you come to Jesus, you got to give up your beer, you got to give up your cigarettes, you got to give up your girls, you got to give up your partying, and I did all that. And I thought, man, I'm ready to give all that up now. I'm ready. I'm, I'm a man. I'm going to give up. I'm going to straighten up and fly right now. About to graduate from high school. Got to get serious about life. Got to move on. Got to leave those childish ways behind me. And that was my attitude. I didn't know what the gospel was. I didn't know it was about grace and mercy and the fact I can't save myself and that God is never impressed with what you think you give up for him. That doesn't impress God. It doesn't make you closer to God. And now you're asking, well, Jack, when did you get saved? I don't know. I know I am now. I know I am now because I know I'm a filthy, dirty, rotten, wretched sinner that deserves every ounce of condemnation from a holy God. I deserve the wrath of God. But Jesus... But Jesus, and Jesus, I don't even hold on to him. He holds on to me. And that's the wisdom Paul is talking about. The unforgiven person can't understand the gospel. That's why it requires the preaching of the gospel. It requires that the gospel be preached and preached and taught and taught over and over and over again because the natural man is hard to get through to. And it's that, it is that kind of wisdom that God gives to people when the gospel is preached. It's very clear in the New Testament. Not much salvation happens, if any at all, until the gospel is spoken. Which makes me wonder in our pulpits these days, where there is so little gospel being preached, how many people are actually coming to Jesus? Many contemporary pulpits never preach the gospel. Oh, they use the word Jesus. They use the word grace. But they never actually preach the gospel. There's a lot of froth that they do preach. They preach on success and sex and miracle money and how to have a better life and how to be successful and prosperous and how to be a better person, but you don't hear the gospel. You don't hear the gospel, and that's a problem, and it explains our churches these days. And perhaps that is the reason you know, we always say, people, both pastors and lay people alike, you, you, probably you've said this, well, you know, the church is just full of lost people. You're right. <laughs> they are. But you know what? I, I don't think it's so much the lost people fault. It is the fault of the pastors who preached on everything but the gospel. You can't be converted without the gospel. And then you still need the gospel every Sunday. You need to be reminded of it all the time. 
So he gives this wisdom. He gives wisdom to us to understand. And it says, he made known to us. He made known to us. He made known to us. Why? Because I wasn't seeking God. I wasn't looking for the one true God. For me, I, I was looking for a better life. It was time to straighten up and fly right. I, I was, I was, I wanted to be more respectable. I wasn't seeking the God of Scripture. I was seeking a self-help God that would help me live my best life now. That's who I was seeking, and that's who many of us seek. But be assured, you didn't come to God because you studied. And through logic and reason, you arrived at the conclusion that all this is true and the Bible is the Word of God. Don't take the credit. If you came to Jesus Christ, it is because God, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the preaching of God's Word, put faith into you and converted you and brought you to the foot of the cross and showed you your sin and caused you to accept Christ so Christ alone could get the glory. He made known to us. Now, that's the theoretical. That's the knowledge that sees things as they really are. Boy, it's hard to see things as they really are sometimes. Is it not? You ever tried figuring out politics? Things are not always what they seem. At your job, probably, things aren't always what they seem sometimes. We're having a relationship. And so it is the job of the gospel, the job of the Holy Spirit, it is the understand that understanding he brings to us that shows us how things really are. How are things really? I wish I could be more positive, but here's how things really are. You see, the gospel, the word gospel means good news. That's what it means. But inherent in the fact that there's good news, there has to be bad news. If there were no bad news, Jesus would have just called it news. So if there's good news, there has to be bad news. Here's how things really are. Before I came to Christ, I was an enemy of God. Jesus wasn't my buddy. He wasn't my homeboy. My picture was not on his refrigerator. I was not a friend of God. In fact, the Bible says I was an enemy of God, an enemy. The Bible says before I came to Christ, I was lost. I had a broken relationship with God that was completely and entirely severed. The Bible goes so far, and here's the clincher, to say that before Jesus converted me, I was dead in my trespasses and sin. Dead. Now, I've asked you this question a million times. What do dead people do? Nothing. So you didn't come to Christ because <laughs> dead people don't do nothing. And that's the bad news. Men and women who don't know Christ are lost, blind, the enemy of God, and under the wrath of God. Well, I, I just, that, that's just not my God. Well, your God is not the God of the Bible. You'll open up this book and read it. In the Old and New Testament, he is a God of wrath and condemnation. And that's bad news. And when God, through his Holy Spirit and the preaching of the gospel, captures your heart 
and shows you your real pitiful condition before a holy God. And, and, and God's standard now, remember, his standard is not good. His standard isn't be good. What is his, water markers, what is his standard? Perfection. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Why do you think in the Bible over and over and over, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times, God said, be ye holy because I'm holy. Now, we read over that, and we don't even think about it. We just keep reading. God, the holy God says, hey, you want to have a relationship with me? You got to be like me, and I'm holy. That's bad news. That's bad news. I'm not holy. I can't strive for holiness. Be perfect? Are you crazy? I can't keep a New Year's resolution past 10 days. Keep the Ten Commandments? I broke an eight of them this morning in church. I can't. Here's the good news. Here's what happens when the gospel is preached. For some, God's Holy Spirit takes that gospel and quickens it and enlightens it and feeds it into someone's spirit. And all of a sudden they go, oh my, I am in desperate straits before a holy God like the publican Jesus talked about, smote his chest and, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's what Paul's talking about, understanding the real situation. And then not just leaving you in that. See, yes, there's condemnation in the gospel, yes. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is deliverance. Jesus on the cross took your condemnation, shed his blood, became your sin. Everything that you were a sinner, he became. The innocent lamb of God took all my sin. And let me tell you, just my sin was enough. That was enough. But he took the sins of the world. And he paid the price of God's wrath for my sin. That's when you see the real story. And God accepted Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus said, it is finished. And the Bible wonderfully proclaims that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the good news. And what Paul is talking about, he gives us wisdom. He makes known to us these ideas. That I am not redeemed, I'm not adopted, I'm not forgiven, but there is a way out. His name is Jesus, who will redeem me, who will adopt me, who will forgive me, who will make me holy before a, uh, a holy God, who writes my, who has written my name in his eternal book, has forgiven me and adopted me into his family. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And it is the Spirit of God that enlightens our eyes. That's the theoretical. He says, then there's wisdom and understanding. It's a beautiful Greek term. This is a more applicable word. It is a prudence that leads to sound judgment. When the Holy Spirit convicts you under the preaching of the gospel about your situation and what Jesus is going to do for you, then, then there's sound judgment. You understand what's going on. That's the practical. You've been enlightened by the knowledge of your sin and the judgment that accompanies it, and you do the only one prudent thing you can do. Fall on your knees at the foot of the cross and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the only prudent thing to do. You understand it. You discern it. You act with shrewdness and judgment and astuteness to comprehend the gospel and stand firm in it. He made known to us. Here's good news. Somewhere in my journey, God made known to me that that decision that I sincerely made, that, that decision I made 
That was the first problem. I was choosing to follow Jesus. I was choosing when I would follow Jesus. That's a problem. But well, that's another sermon series. Um, but along the way, God, through the study of Scripture and, and, and deep conversations with spiritual people, I've realized it was Jesus who decided on me. Not because I earned it, not because I deserved it, not because I merited it at all, but solely and specifically by his love and his grace. There was nothing good in me, nothing, but he chose me. And then he talks about the mystery of his will. Paul talks about the mystery of God's will a lot in his writings. Twenty times in the New Testament, the mystery of God's will is mentioned 16 by the Apostle Paul. And let me just share with you a page or two over what he says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6 and verse 9. Surely, he says, you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Now let me pause there. You know what a Christian's job is for the rest of his, his or her Christian life? Is that. To understand the insight into the mystery of the work of Christ. To study, to search, to pray, and to get deeper and deeper into what God has done for us in Christ. So that the generations has now been revealed to, to, by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. He was one. He says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, share, sharers together in the promise of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, for which for ages past was kept hidden in God. In chapter 5 and verse 32, he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. In verse chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, pray for me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. What is a pastor's job? Not to make you successful. Not to entertain you. Not to be cool, although I am cool. It's none of that stuff. It is a pastor, like Paul, it is a pastor's job to make known to you the mystery and the riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's my job. In 1 Timothy 3.16, he says, Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He's talking about Christ and the gospel. He appeared in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in the glory. What is that? It's the gospel. This mystery is not some odd, mystical, magical conundrum that is unintelligible to us, to human reason and thought. It's not some mystical madness. Paul says we can understand the mystery of salvation. We can understand what God has done for us in Christ. We can. It was something hidden. The gospel was something hidden in the Old Testament that the New Testament reveals. Now, there were pointers in the Old Testament to the gospel. Much of God's work with Israel talks, it points to the gospel. The tabernacle and temple points to the gospel. The sacrifices point to the gospel. The, the Old Testament points to that time when redemption would be secured. And then 2,000 years ago, God became flesh and dwelt among us. And everything that was promised in the Old Testament was fulfilled in him. That's the mystery of the gospel. 
And Paul said they had, they had pieces of it back then. They had bits and pieces. It was very unclear. But Paul says, we see it now. It's been revealed to us in Jesus Christ and in his salvation. This mystery, he says, was kept hidden to previous generations. It included the Gentiles. Say amen. That's us. It includes me. That's good news. It's worked out through the church. It destines us to glory. The focal point of this gospel is Jesus Christ. This, the, the center of the mystery is Jesus. Now, in this text, he says, the wisdom and understanding that he's lavished on us, it provides all the spiritual blessings he lists and what we've been preaching about. It is for his good pleasure a couple of times in this text. Paul says what God did in Christ was for his good pleasure. Now, I don't quite understand that. That does not mean that God looked at me and saw something so valuable in me that he just had to have me on his team. That's not what it means. What God did somehow in redemption mysteriously pleases him. And we may not know that till we get to heaven. But it also brings together in people in unity. And he goes on to say that, and I'm going to talk about that next week. The, he brings people together in unity in all things, in sin, in, in, in heaven and in earth under Christ. So here's the point. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one that seeks God. Just because you post a little, seri a little spiritual, often incorrect meme on Facebook about Jesus does not mean you are a seeker of God. Just because you have some vague, nebulous idea of some man upstairs that you think you got a relationship, you, th you think you and God are good. Yeah, we good, we good. Don't worry about me, preacher, I'm good. That's not it at all. There's none that seek after God. No not one. Until, can we go back to R.C. Sproul, until the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached and the Holy Spirit takes the preaching of the gospel and, in, and raises a dead man to life with it. Conversion. Raises a dead person to life with it. Then and only then does that person start seeking God. Now I know you're, you got ping pong balls in your head right now, but just go ahead and say amen because this is the truth and it's the Bible. Amen. Dead people don't do anything until they're quickened. Until they're made alive. I don't seek God. I was dead. But when Christ and his gospel spoke and resurrected me, Ephesians 2, 1, you whom he has quickened, made alive, then I realize my state before a holy God. And the Holy Spirit points me to the cross of Calvary and the completed, finished work of, of Christ on my behalf. And he applies redemption, adoption, forgiveness, mercy, grace. He gives it to me. For by grace I am saved through faith, that not of myself. It's a gift. He gives it to me. Then and only then do I begin living a life of seeking God. Then and only then. And unfortunately, that may explain why we have a lot of churchgoers, but they're not interested in seeking God. 
They don't read the Bible. <laughs> you know what? They're not seeking God. You know what? Dead people don't. Dead people don't. You say, Jack, I've been in church a thousand years. Are you telling me there's a possibility I'm a goat and not a sheep? Yes. Yes. I don't say that in love, in hatred. I don't say it in arrogance. I don't say it condemningly or judgmentally. I say that in love. And it's time we begin looking at ourselves and asking serious questions about where we stand with a holy God. But on the other end, I'm grateful for every spiritual blessing. I've been chosen, predestined, I've been made holy, I've been adopted, redeemed, forgiven, and enlightened through the work of Jesus Christ. To the praise of God and to the praise of His glory. Old hymn we used to sing. I'm sure Ms. Audrey sung it a few times. To God be the glory. Great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son. I like part of the next verse when he talks about heaven. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Let me tell you something, folks. Heaven is not about going to see Uncle Joe or Grandpa Sally or seeing your dead dog. Heaven is about Jesus. It's about Jesus. To God be the glory. Praise the Lord, the chorus says. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. You don't get any credit. He gets it all for every spiritual blessing.